Hi folks, welcome back to Two Cooks, Three Cats. Uh, today I'm going to be teaching Ricky how to make a cocktail that is kind of original. Um, I uh, first had what is called a saint at a local place called Olympic Pizza. Fell in love with the, the flavors because it's a whiskey based cocktail. And uh, I wasn't quite sure on the portion so I kind of created my own. Uh, and I've done a little adding of uh, some bitters to it that I, it makes a really tasty cocktail. And we're calling um, this the Topher, correct? And yes, I'm calling it the Topher because I don't have a name for it. And, and then, I don't want to call it the Saint because that, I feel like, is ripping off somebody else's cocktail. And then for the second half of the show today where I teach Topher, uh, we're going to be focusing on knife skills today. And we're going to show you a fun uh, chicken dish and an orange ginger dessert. So Topher, if you want to take it away with a cocktail. Well, first I'm going to show you how to slice up a lemon, um, which is maybe most people know. Um, but if you don't, well, here you go. So you will cut off the ends. I should say a lemon for cocktails. Cut off the ends, not useful, toss them. And then you cut a lemon in half. There's a couple different ways you can do this. You can slice it down to get the triangle wedges, or you can, uh, well, slice it down the middle this way to get the uh, triangle edges, or slice it this way if you want the little round, rounded edges. Um, I personally like the triangle for this particular one because I'm going to try to get some of the juice out of it. So I'm going to slice it down the middle there and then cut it into four to five pieces. And then you why, just store them for later. Why did you put a slice in the middle? Because that can now, you can now set that on your beverage. Oh, you can set it for the side of the glass. As a garnish, oh, or if you don't want the lemon in your drink, or you want to squeeze just a little bit, you know, however you want to do that. Um, or actually, actually, this way. You slice it this way, right down the middle. And then you can get several slices this way, depending on how you want to garnish your drink. So now you got little round wedges, or you got the triangular wedges, which is what I'm going to use for this one. So... Oh, no, just need one. Let me put those in the fridge, my dear. Um, all right. Where's that? There it is. Time. All right. Also, I like my drinks really, really cold, so I, uh, especially when it's in a cocktail glass, so I'm going to give it a little bit of an ice bath to chill the glass. Make it nice and cold so that my drink doesn't warm up as soon as it hits the glass. Good idea. All right, now for the actual cocktail. Cocktail shaker, get some ice. So for this drink, it calls for Jameson Saint-Germain, which is in French elderflower liqueur. Very, very common, easy to find. And then I've added some orange bitters. They can be any brand. This particular brand was given to us by our lovely sister Phoebe called the Bitter Housewife. <laughs> Fun name. Um, but this is essentially what's going into it with some lemon. So squeeze the lemon in. Get all the juice out of the lemon there. Uh, citrus goes really good with whiskey cocktails, by the way, if you did not know that. Gonna be a two ounce pour of whiskey and I lost a little bit so I'm just gonna add a little bit more not a booze hound or anything but I am one ounce pour of Saint Germain what is Saint Germain it's an elderflower liqueur um, so you want you can take a little taste there it's, it's sweeter Kind of like a, well, that tasted like lemon and honey, but kind of like a lemon that's, type flavor. That's really good. Uh, if I, you don't uh, like it sweet, you can use like just um, half an ounce. I particularly like the flavor of St. Germain, so I put yeah. in a full ounce. I like the flavor of this liqueur. I'm not a whiskey fan, but I am going to try this drink uh, when he's all done. That's why I'm only making one today. Um, but this is really tasty. So when I shake... Uh, Cocktails, I grab a towel because my hands are super susceptible to cold and I like my drinks really cold. This gets freezing uh, when shaken. So make sure you got a lid on there and then shake away. Ooh, 
Uh, some people may say that was too much and you bruised the whiskey. I don't give a crap about bruised whiskey. I find that saying to be absolutely ridiculous. I don't know if it's true or not. That is a pretty color. It is. And actually, I have a better way to get all of the whiskey out. I nope. prefer this over the... Do you know if that tool has a special name? I've always wondered. I just call it a cocktail strainer. It's Yeah, it's just a strainer. Oh, okay. I like it better than this because the uh, pith and the ice block the little holes in there. Ah. And it's harder to get the, the actual cocktail out of, gorgeous. out of the shaker. Oh, did you want a uh, lemon for the glass? Uh, no, I'm not going to put a lemon on oh. the glass. I'm actually going to give it a lemon twist. That's right. Here, I want to get a close-up of this one. And also, when uh, when doing the twist, uh, whenever you cut into a lemon, it spritz out the, the citrus juice there. So I do it close to the glass just so I can get kind of that spritz on the, the glass itself. And do you need to have that tool at home for them you to do You don't this? need to. You can use a knife. Um, it, it just makes it really convenient and you get an, a pretty twist out of it um, because okay. it's close up of the tool yeah. so they can see what it looks like. So the little right. sharp point goes into the rind and it, it kind of just takes off the rind and you can see it's fairly thin. Which camera? <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah. Play to the that camera. was everywhere. So um, it comes off the lemon. But it comes that. off a little bit easier and then you just wrap it around your finger to make a twist. And it's, I mean, it's a garnish. It, it does nothing for the drink. It doesn't really add that much flavor. It just adds, it's the earrings as you like to say. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a nice little twist in your drink. Beautiful. That is not a beautiful twist, but it is what it is. And then, there you go. You have the Topher. And I'm like out of the screenshot. There you go. <laughs> Cheers. Try a little taste of that. Mm, that is lovely. It smells very citrusy. It, it is. Sm it smells almost like a candied lemon. Kinda. Except it's got that bourbon flavor, which you're not gonna like. Well, I said the scent. It's like a candied lemon. Oh, yeah. It's that, that's because even with the, the whiskey, that's not bad. The elderflower sweetens mm -hmm. that up a bit. Very yeah. nice. It's lovely. And one of my favorite cocktails. Nice. Well, uh, we'll be back with the actual cooking lesson. All right, welcome back. So, uh, for the second part of the show, I'm going to teach Topher some basic knife skills. And we're going to talk about two dishes today. We're going to have an herb stuffed chicken breast that we're going to be working on. Mm -hmm. We have some chicken in it. I know, these are so good and so simple. We have some chicken in a brine here. We'll talk about that. And all of this will be in the recipes, by the way. Be sure to download them. Uh, the link will be in the description for the video. Uh, we have a lovely plate of herbs here we're going to use. And we're also going to make an orange and ginger dessert tonight. We're going to teach you how to peel these guys with your knives so you can practice your knife skills at home. And it's going to be really tasty. I love this dinner. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about are the knives that you need in the kitchen. Um, you don't need to go out and buy a big block of knives. The knives... You, they should all be <laughs> sharp enough to stab your husband. Yes, yes, they should. Um, and make sure that you have two so you can stab back. Um, there's really only three types of knives you need. You can see a bunch on the cutting board here. Uh, a long serrated knife. Uh, my favorites are offsets. This one is a tiny bit offset. Uh, we have three different kinds of chef's knives here, and we have three different kinds of pairing knives. A pairing knife, a chef knife, and a long serrated knife are really the only knives you need in your kitchen. What did you mean by offset? Uh, offset means that the blade is here, and in a real offset one, the handle juts up this way and here, so that when you're chopping on the board, see how my knuckles get in the way? Mm -hmm. Your knuckles wouldn't be in the way. Gotcha. Um, so that's what offset means. Uh, but I just particularly like this knife because it's very handy. And when I shove it right in front of my husband's face, and he moves his face that way, that's lovely. Um, the only reason I wanted to lay these out is to show you that a knife with the same name, like a paring knife or a chef knife, can look slightly different. Chef's knives come anywhere from six to 12 inches long. Um, the blades on a chef knife in general are very wide and deep. Um, they uh, sometimes come to a point, some do not. Uh, you'll see the Santoku style, which has the little divots in the blade. I don't find too much difference in performance from these types of knives. Uh, my favorite one is this guy, just because he's very well weighted and balanced and constructed. And then pairing knives, uh, generally go from three to six inches, I believe, is the longest. Um, they'll vary a little bit in blade width and whatnot as well. You can see these guys are pairing knives and they look really different. Um, so not too worried about that. All three of them do. They do, yeah. This one is a little shorter and narrower than that one is. Um, but in general, 
herring knives are for your small, fine, delicate jobs. So uh, taking tops off tomatoes, cutting strawberries, fanning strawberries, things like that. Perfect. Uh, oh, the teensy one's on our table. She might jump over here soon. Uh, chef's knives are the workhorses of your kitchen. Uh, these guys are really great, especially ones that are well built like this guy. Um, uh, that have all the parts to them. You can crush bones, you can crush nuts. Um, they have a lot of strength because the spine on them is really thick. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the workhorses of your kitchen. I use a chef's knife for almost everything. And then your long serrated knives. Uh, these guys are beautiful for slicing bread, for torting cakes, which means when you cut them in half so you can put a filling in the middle. Um, these are also wonderful for slicing big pieces of meat so you get a nice clean cut. Teensy one, stop shaking the table. Uh, so that's what these are all for. But for right now, we are going to take a low teensy one. We're gonna take these guys away and we're gonna focus on our pairing and our chef's knives this evening. Let's gather some herbs here. So we have some sage, we have some rosemary, and we have some thyme that we're going to use for our chicken tonight. I'm gonna demo chicken this tonight. for you. Let's grab a stem each. We didn't have chicken tonight when you were saying that all the time. So to start, uh, for your sage, you want to pull off the tops of the leaves, leave the thick stem behind. Sage is a very strong herb. You don't need a whole lot of it. For our sage, mm -hmm. we're going to pull off the tiny stems and the, the really tender parts. Uh, for the woody parts, you can hold it at the top like a rosemary sprig and peel on down. Do we want to keep this one or do the same thing? Go ahead and do it to that one. Anything that's really woody, you want to try to get the leaves off. Time can be a pain in the butt to do that for. Or twiggy. If it's nice and tender. Mm -hmm. Twiggy. What'd you say? Nothing. I'm being ridiculous. Okay. Um, if it's nice and tender, you can just chop it up really fine into mm. your dish. I've never had any problems with time in that. Is that rosemary, rosemary smells like Christmas. So rosemary is the same thing. Um, this is one herb that I will say don't use dried. Uh, rosemary is part of the pine family. And uh, these needles get really sharp and terrible to eat when they're dry. They burn really quickly when they're dry and get very bitter. So always use fresh. Yep, and you can see how Topher just held the top there and slid right down. So we're gonna show you how to chop these guys, technique called walking the knife. Get your herbs into a pile. Uh, so when you're holding your knife, there are two holds you can do. Uh, you can do a handle hold or a blade hold. Some people call a blade hold a pinch hold. Um, I'm not really concerned about the name. I'm gonna show you how to do it. Handle hold is kind of what it sounds like. You have four fingers wrapped around your handle, thumb goes on the other side, and you're ready to chop. This is not my favorite one. I feel this one has less power and less control, especially when you're chopping a lot of things. So I enjoy a blade hold. And that is three fingers around your handle, index finger on one side of the blade, right above this little part here is called the bolster. And then your thumb, and this is why some people call it a pinch hold, pinching with your index finger. So you're holding it like this. And you may want to shoot on this side because I'm left-handed, I'm going to go this way. Uh, so to start our little pile here, we get everything all together and we're just going to run our knife through once. Now when you're chopping, you can see that the knife is going down, we'll do it slow, and forward. This is going to give you an easier chopping action than just trying to barrel down straight through the food. You're also going to dull your knife quicker that way. So down and forward is the motion you want to practice. And when you first start doing this, do an exaggerated motion. Go down and forward. You can see there's a little curve to your blade here, and you want to use that curve to your advantage. So on the cutting board, you can see that the tip of the knife isn't coming up off the board. We're keeping it down. So down and forward, down and forward to get everything chopped. And then we reclaim our pile. Now we're going to show you how to walk the knife. So you can continue to do that back and forth, but a good way to do this quickly in practice is find the place on your board and in your pile where your knife is in the middle. Once you find that place, keep the tip where it is, move over to the side. Using the heel of your other hand with just a little bit of pressure, you're not digging this into the cutting board, it will help you keep the tip in the right place and then down and forward, and you're gonna walk your knife across your pile. And as you do that, continue to gather. Don't scrape with the blade of your knife. 
scrape at the back of your knife. That will help keep your blade sharper longer. And then continue to walk your knife. And as your pile spreads out, bring it back together into a nice neat little pile. And you continue this until your herbs are as fine as you need. Now we're just gonna stuff a chicken breast pocket today. Um, so we don't need it too fine, but there we go. Nice little pile. So Topher has all of our herbs chopped up and we also added some garlic that we put through a garlic press into here. Buy a garlic about... press, don't chop it, it's just easier. <laughs> or, because this is a knife skills class, I know you can tell them to practice their garlic chopping. Practice your garlic chopping. There you go. Get a presser. So for our chicken, which we have sitting in a brine here, a brine, if you don't know, is just a solution of salt and water and sugar, imparts flavor and moisture to um, all kinds of meat. Uh, there's large brine debates going on. I love brine, I use it all the time. And you don't want to rinse your brine off your meat, but we do want to pat this dry. So Topher, I'm gonna grab two of these and we're gonna have you pat those guys really dry. So you wanna start with your hand flat on top of your chicken breast and you're gonna grab your paring knife. Now you want to get your paring knife into your chicken breast. You don't want it to go through the back. We wanna to try to keep the back nice and solid. We're just gonna create a pocket in here. And once it's inside there with your hand on top so your chicken breast doesn't move around, you're going to keep the knife level and you're staying about halfway up the breast from the bottom and move all the way to the other end and pull out. So when you're done, you have a beautiful little pocket. Now, if you haven't gone back far enough, you can use your knife to kind of slash a little area in between, but I think we're doing pretty good there. Beautiful. Mm, yep, good. you can attack it from either side of the chicken breast. It doesn't really matter. You want to keep your knife level because if you cut down, mm -hmm. you're going to have a really thick part and a really thin part. You want to keep it in the middle and keep it mm. straight. Don't go like that mm. because you're going to cut through the end of the chicken. Mm. So keep it straight and keep going back. Oh, okay. Well, I kind of. So I did, well, I did exactly what you said, like I didn't go deep enough, so now I gotta cut it a little more. Oh, I know, you weren't done cutting the pocket though. That's what I was oh. trying to tell you. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah, keeping it straight and then keep cutting to the end and then stuff. Because if you have it angled this way, you're mm -hmm. gonna cut all the way through the chicken. Gotcha. So I'll cut that a little bit more. That looks good. I would keep it like that. Cut a little bit more. Because you're gonna go all the way through if you keep going. I did go all the way through. you're going to. Seems all right, so we're gonna mix our garlic in here and I'm also going to add a little bit of kosher salt to our mixture about a quarter teaspoon now keep in mind you are handling raw poultry here uh, so we're gonna make sure that we're using this herb mixture uh, for this dish if we have any leftover that we want to use for something, make sure that it's cooked first. Food safety is very important. Now, do you have to use thyme, rosemary, or and sage, or can you do like other combinations? No, nope. you can use your favorite combination of herbs. I've done this with this combination. I've done it with jalapenos and garlic and bacon mm. and onion. Mm. Um, really whatever you think is going to be tasty. I just enjoy this one. This is uh, the thyme, the sage, and the rosemary are your classic uh, poultry seasonings. Okay. So we're gonna take about half this, and you're gonna grab the other half. You need about a mm, tablespoon, tablespoon and a half per chicken breast. And we're just going to shove it into the pocket. Make sure to push it back into the little corners and into the back of the chicken. Get it all inside. Take that chicken. And then just close the flap down. There's no need to tie this. Uh, there's no need to sew it shut or anything. Um, the great thing about this is your herbs are gonna add a whole lot of flavor to your chicken, mm -hmm. um, especially on the inside. They're not very thick. This isn't like a bread stuffing, so we don't have to worry about uh, the temperature being off in the center and then our chicken overcooking. Um, and because the stuffing isn't very thick, folding the flap back down is gonna make mother nature think that this is all one chicken breast again, so it'll all cook the same, so we're not worried about the cut in that. Could you do like a chicken cordon bleu kind of thing, like throw some ham and cheese in there too? Uh, you could, if you wanted to, yeah. 
All right, uh, we will meet you over at the stove. We're gonna show you how to sear this off and get it into the oven. All right, what are we doing here with the uh, with the oil in the pan here? <clears throat> okay, so we are going to sear our chicken. Uh, hopefully you can see on camera, we have a little bit of smoke going in our pan here. Uh, you want your pan to be extremely hot. So we uh, put cold oil in cold pan, put it over high heat, and uh, we're not gonna cook the chicken all the way through in the pan. We're just searing the outside to get some color, which will add some extra flavor as well. But if, if this isn't hot, your chicken's not gonna brown. Uh, there's something called the Malheur reaction, which I'll talk about after I get the chicken in. So, so you literally want steam coming out of the pan, or not steam, smoke. smoke. Yeah, there's no water in there. Um, and you don't want any water in there. That's the other reason we patted the chicken dry in the very beginning. We just want oil in here. So top side goes down. If you ever work in a restaurant, they say show side goes down, because when we flip this over, that's what people will be seeing. We don't want to overload our pan. Because oh, you want to keep that heat nice and hot. Now, splatter screen is great to have here. We're going to put that over. And the Malheur reaction I was talking about happens at, uh, I think it's 340 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's just browning on food. Um, but that's when proteins start to caramelize. So we're going to let this sear on both sides for about 45 seconds each side, and then we're going to pop it into a preheated 425 degree oven that already has a sheet pan in there heating up. And that way you're not popping it on a cold sheet pan and stopping that cooking process. Uh, so we'll see you back after we have the first sear done. Okay, so it's been about 45 seconds. We're going to flip our chicken over. And you can see we have some nice browning on there. Now, you'll notice that that chicken, and our vent off here so you can hear me. You'll notice that that chicken released right away. If it wasn't ready to turn over, if you only went 15 or 30 seconds, one, it wouldn't be enough brown, and two, it would still be stuck to the pan. So the chicken actually tells you when it's ready to be flipped. All right, this is ready to go into the preheated oven with a very hot pan. And so far, if you get the camera close, you may be able to hear that sizzle when I put it on. That sizzle is important to happen. So this is going to continue to cook in our 425 degree oven until an internal temperature of about 160. Then we're going to pull out the chicken, let it rest for 10 to 15 minutes, to continue cooking. <clears throat> Alright, so we're going to start on our dessert. Tonight's dessert is an orange mint and ginger dessert. Um, so we have all those ingredients here. We have some navel oranges, and some ginger, ginger. that's been in our freezer. Ginger. Ginger. Been in our freezer, and then a lovely handful of mint. The mint is going to be nothing new. This is going to be just like chopping our other herbs. We're going to peel the leaves off. And uh, we don't need these, it's fine. Uh, you can go ahead and start if you want. Um, oh, I do want to show them, however. When you're doing a lot of chopping and cutting, you don't want your cutting board to move around. And you can see this is pretty sturdy on here. And the reason for that is if we lift up the board, I have li these little kitchen non-skid things. Uh, these are really cheap and easy to find in any home section. If you don't have any of these and you don't want to buy them, you can also use a damp towel. But that way, when you're chopping, your board isn't sliding across your counter on you. This way you have a nice, sturdy space. So we can go ahead and strip the leaves off of our mint. We don't need to use all of this tonight. I would say just a couple tablespoons. And you want to get most of the thick stems off, because we're not going to chop this very fine. I actually just want you to do a chiffonade of these guys. Have we talked about chiffonade on the show yet? No. What's a chiffonade? So chiffonade, uh, it literally translates to uh, little rags, and uh, most people think it's little ribbons. Um, but the reason it's called that is, I'll let you do it, but I'll gather some up here. For broadleaf uh, herbs like mint or basil or sage, you gather them in a little pile and roll them up and then you cut these little strips from your roll and when you do it you have these little tears or rags or ribbons that's called a chiffonade 
So do I want to bunch all of these up? Yeah, you can just, but when you have a big pile like that, yeah, exactly like that. You can just bunch it all up together, and then you're just going to run your knife through it sideways. Just like when you were walking with that down and forward motion, but the tip of your knife doesn't need to stay in one place. More than that? Um, no, I think that's good. Um, so I'm going to show you how to peel an orange with your knife. Um, this is just great practice to learn how to hold your knife, learn how your knife feels, learn how it cuts. Um, and become a little more dexterous with it so you can feel confident in your kitchen. So first thing we're going to do is cut off the bottom and we want to cut in far enough that we're just reaching the top of the fruit and if you look at this we're just getting a lot of that pith off. We're going to cut off the other end and this is going to give us two flat surfaces to work on so that our orange isn't rolling around. So safety first. Now the fun part. So what you're going to be able to see in the close-up probably appear over here. It, oh no, 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 you can stay there. The video is going to appear over here. Is we're going to take the peel off and we want to start the knife right where the pith meets the fruit because we're getting the pith off. The pith is that white area and it's very bitter. And we're going to back and forth motion as we press down on the knife and curve the nice knife around to follow the fruit. And when we go for the next cut, you want to turn the fruit toward your body that way you can see where you need to cut and you're going to line the blade up and then you can see with that second cut following down where you need to go and eventually you can get quick at this and we can peel an orange in just seconds and then when you're done flip it over see if there's any pithy areas that you missed on the bottom cut those off and then our fruit is ready to cut for our dessert. And Tilfer, why don't you give it a try? Good, both ends. And then start your knife right between the pith and the fruit. There you go, follow it down slowly. And when you're going, so make sure, before you start again, mm -hmm. make sure that you're doing back and forth because in the middle you just went straight down and follow around the fruit. The idea is to get as little fruit on this when you're cutting as you can. And yeah, follow, there you go. And I just follow the contour. Uh, so to finish up for our dessert, we're, I'll cut one, you can cut the other. We're gonna cut these guys in half. I like to take out the center portion that has some extra pith in it. Set that to the side. And we're just gonna cut little half moons. No, just some thin round. little slices tonight. I think my round lemons for the cocktail. Yep, but again, uh, this is where you're practicing with your knife. These aren't hard to do, but fo uh, forward and down, forward and down. Don't just slam through your fruit because you're gonna crush it otherwise. So forward and down to get those nice slices. And then after we finish up the orange here, we're gonna show him how to cut some simple ginger discs for our syrup. So we have some don't go away. We have some pieces of ginger root here. These are a little soft. When you buy ginger, um, after I use what I need, I throw it whole in the freezer. It's a great way to preserve ginger. It can stay in there for about a year, uh, no loss of flavor, and uh, you don't have to peel it. The only caveat is it'll get soft. It won't be really firm anymore. Um, but for most recipes, that's really not a big deal. It'll get soft after you take it out of the freezer and let it sit for a little while. Well, yeah, when it melts. Otherwise, off. it's frozen. Um, so all we really need are little discs of ginger. So go ahead and chop up the rest of that guy. Beautiful. So you can see when we're done, we're just working with little slices of ginger. And uh, it's because off beautiful aromatics in your kitchen. Uh, this is going to get into a syrup um, of uh, one part brown sugar and half part water. Uh, that'll all be on the recipe in the link and we're gonna make a little sauce for our dessert. Beautiful. Yay! Okay, welcome back. So we're gonna show you how to get the dessert together. Uh, Topher, why don't you go ahead and tilt the bowl up. You can see that we have the oranges and mint that Topher chopped in our bowl and ready to go. Uh, we also have some orange liqueur here. We're using triple sec tonight. You can use any orange liqueur you would like. We're not cooking this. There's a lot of simple flavors in here. Uh, so if you want to use something a little more expensive, like a uh, Cointreau, you can. Triple sec, you can, I often like to use um, 
vodka that I put orange peel in and sat for like a month. Grand Marnier nice would homemade. be really good. Grand in Marnier, this. yeah, is a really wonderful one as well. So really, whatever you're looking for. I mean, you can even go crazy and do uh, ginger liqueurs in here. Or actually, uh, you mentioned earlier Saint Germain mm -hmm. would probably taste good in here. I've never tried in this dish. The other thing we have, do you go ahead and tilt that forward if you can. So this is the syrup, the ginger syrup that we made. So the sliced ginger oh, went that's into a pot. That's okay. The sliced ginger went into a pot with uh, one cup of brown sugar and half a cup of mm. water. We brought that just to a heavy boil, turned off the heat, and this has been sitting for at least 20 to 25 minutes. Helps to infuse it with some of that ginger flavor. And, and it's not super strong ginger either. It's, no. It's just a hint. It's a hint of ginger, just gives a nice flavor to this dish, and also helps to sweeten it up. Which, so, I love ginger, but I don't like it super strong. Like ginger beer, not like that. not going to pour that whole thing in there. You're going to have more syrup than you need. Put this in the fridge, use it for tea, use it for coffee, mm -hmm. use it on ice creams. It's really, really wonderful. We're going to do just a couple tablespoons. Uh, so go ahead and pour. And we have the strainer there just to catch the ginger pieces. It's very dark, by the way. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because we use dark brown sugar. That's good. Uh, and you can use as much syrup as you'd like to taste. So you can taste this when you're done. If you want it sweeter, go for it. This ginger uh, is really sweet and candied now. Even though it has the peel on it, you could just eat those and they're yummy. And why don't you go ahead and add just a small shot of the triple sec. You don't need a whole lot. Um, the alcohol in this helps to bring out other flavors in the salad you may not taste otherwise. Am I gonna toss it all? Yep, go ahead and give it a toss. And that is pretty much it for the salad. Now the great thing about this dessert is it can be made a couple days ahead of time. Uh, mm -hmm. Stored in the mm -hmm. fridge and then pulled out and all the flavors will be Commingly. It's really quite beautiful. I like this salad much more chilled. I like uh, chilled fruit instead of um, like uh, room temperature fruit. I mean, it's still tasty, but mm -hmm. cold, it just to me is so much better. And it has um, mm. it has that sweet bite and it's kind of deep because of the brown sugar. So it's got the freshness of the mint and it's got a little bite of the ginger. Uh, so we'll be back in just a minute and we're going to show you our beautiful chicken when it's all done. No. Uh, welcome back. So we have our chicken ready. Uh, so um, Topher, uh, if you remember, we wanted to temp this to 160. Once the chicken is at 160, we pull it out of the oven. Uh, we put it on a plate and gave it a little half container, or a half lid rather. Uh, we want to keep most of the heat in and this will continue to cook mm -hmm. up to 165, which is a safe temperature for chicken. So this is all done and one of the reasons we do this, so if you cut into the chicken, if you cook it in the oven to 165, and then you cut into it right away and serve it up, um, the chicken is continuing to cook, which means the muscle fiber is continuing to contract, mm -hmm. and it's going to push out water, because it has nowhere else to go. So if you cut into it right away, you're releasing, you're cutting into all of those cells, and all of that water is gonna end up on your plate instead of staying in your chicken. Which gives you dry chicken. Exactly, it gives you dry chicken. And if you look, some of that happens as it continues to cook. You can see that little pool of juice there. This is just from the chicken sitting for about 10 minutes while partially covered. It's still nice and hot, plenty to serve. Um, but that's how much you lose just without cutting it. And that's also the reason for the brine. The beautiful inside of this chicken. To serve this, I usually just do some little thin slices. You can see the steam in there. And Topher and I are gonna try a little piece of this. Here you can see the beautiful color on the inside. If you see pink on the inside of your chicken, you didn't temp it. <laughs> try a little piece. Yeah, I will. Mmm, yeah. Well, it's really juicy. The brine adds a nice saltiness to it. Mm -hmm. Lots of flavor without being overwhelming. And then we have those herbs in the center, which are flavoring the chicken from the center out. Mm. Jalapeno, bacon, and goat cheese in the middle of that. Mm. That would be lovely. All right, so we have our chicken. Let's get this out of the way. It's our dinner tonight. And then uh, Hofer is gonna serve up our dessert for us. So he pulled out two little martini glasses, which I think are just adorable. If you're trying to be fancy. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we whipped up a little bit of whipped cream, just a soft whip, and we flavored it with a little bit of our ginger syrup. So yeah, like maybe a tablespoon of ginger syrup uh, to, to sweeten the cream. Yeah, just to lightly sweeten it and give it some flavor. 
because our dessert is already fairly sweet. So Topher's gonna pile our, our oranges and our mints, our ginger syrup and our liqueur into our little glasses. And we're just gonna do a little dollop of cream on here. Anytime you have any kind of acidic dessert like this, so if you're doing it, you know, if you're serving with balsamic vinegar or oranges, uh, cream just makes such a lovely addition. And we whip this up kind of soft. It's not at heavy peaks. I like that because it kind of trails down over a little more cream on there. I'll grab you a spoon. A little bit of cream my ass. <laughs> and you know, dessert first. So cheers. Thank you for joining cheers. us on Two Cooks, Three Cats. God, cheers, Topher. Go make this for dessert. It's like a cream sickle with a little added kick. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you for joining us. There are no cats today, unfortunately. Can you see one knock the table? Oh, she did knock the table over. It's true. Mm. Uh, we will see you next time. Thank you.